Okay, uh, we're now ready to proceed with the uh, second uh, paper, which is uh, how moldy are those oldies? Uh, and the two presenters will be, first John Levin is a pro prolific 40 year collector of early cylinder and disc recordings. John Levin is focused on optimal methods for cylinder audition, transfer, preservation, and remediation. His CPS-1 cylinder playback system is now in use at sound archives and by advanced private collectors. The V-Trace series developed by John in conjunction with SoundSmith is the only line, <clears throat> excuse me, of contemporary cartridges to play vertical cut uh, cylinders and records. Uh, presenting with him is Don Wilson, who is the technical director uh, at Environmental Fuel Research LLC in Philadelphia. John? Uh, actually, I'm going to turn it over to Don first, but right now I need to uh, launch the file, clicking the important uh, share sound box. Okay, we're ready to go. Don's going to kick it off. All right. Thanks, John. Uh, so most audio archivists and record collectors here already know me for the copies that I make of early disc records, and um, uh, some have also heard that I've worked in organic chemistry. In 2013, I formed a small research company uh, along with professors of chemical engineering from Drexel University and University of Pennsylvania. Uh, since 2013, we've researched technologies surrounding separating fats, oils, and greases from uh, wastewater, then converting them into fuel oils known as biodiesel. I've received funding from the US EPA, the Department of Energy, the USDA, and I'm a visiting researcher at Drexel University's Department of Chemical Engineering. In addition to biodiesel, I also operated Wilson Soap Company, making handmade soap for 17 stores across the USA. The chemistry related to these two fields, biodiesel and soap, uh, both have many aspects which are directly applicable to the general understanding and composition of cylinder wax. And to kick off a little bit about me, um... I'm mostly known as a focus collector of early cylinder recordings, but my audiophilia actually began as a typical kid fascinated that sound could be educed, to use Patrick Feaster's term, from physical objects, namely discs. Um, in adolescence, I was drawn to content, first rock, then jazz, where I discovered the intimacy of recorded music. Uh, I was seduced by the crafted sonic experiences that its creators wanted to give me, despite the imperfections of the delivery medium in between. The delivery medium in between, that delivery medium in between, it was and still is a media divide I want to cross. I want to hear what the content creators wanted me to hear. Ironically, this desire drew me to the earliest recordings where the media divide is often huge and the creator's sonic goals are often most diffuse. The, divide, the, the desire to bridge this gap led me to develop the CPS-1 cylinder playback system now in its third generation. Then because L minus R signal extraction with LP cartridges was an additional obstacle between me and what is in the groove, basically I developed V-Trace, the only cartridge optimized to play cylinders. But while I've been evolving my transcribing technology, one obstacle has stymied me. It's what's generally described as mold. Mold is a catch-all term for cylinder degradation that mostly seems to be related to environmental effects. It's different from usage effects such as wear, pits, cracks, and scratches that are better understood and where we have more tools to address them. Mold is found primarily on wax cylinders of the 10,000 odd uh, early black and brown wax records I've handled, a significant percentage of them have some degree of mold. And from this much exposure, I've learned that cylinders aren't moldy in the same way. Some are encrusted with mold, whereas others have faint, transparent, cloud-like puffs. Others have defined edges. Sometimes patches look like they were sponged on. Sometimes the mold is tiny dots, and other times these are tiny spidery structures. 
I've been perplexed by these variations and wanted concrete information about them. Plus, to use Jessica Thompson's term, I wanted to literally excavate the mold to uncover actual content underneath. So, in 2019, I asked Don Wilson for his help. One of the first questions for Don was if, in fact, mold is mold. His answer is coming up, but what also emerged was the first step I needed to classify the cylinder degradation that I routinely encounter. In so doing, I realized that mold folds, falls into defined categories, though sometimes there is degradation on one record that falls into multiple categories. There are also variations in mold density, mold color, and mold distribution across cylinder surfaces. So here they are. These 11 categories broadly specify the mold types I encounter. With this system, we can investigate possible connections between what we're seeing and what we're hearing. So a few points about uh, this table. While some degradation is semi-transparent, other examples are quite defined with relatively sharp edges and complete opacity. Axial stripes are relatively common in degraded records. This looks like the product of horizontal storage, and indeed many think it is. But the fact is, I rarely find cylinders stored on their sides. Fog is also relatively common, particularly in later brown wax cylinders. It's my favorite kind of degradation because unlike all the other types on this chart, it's easily removed. The bottom half of this cylinder was cleaned by gently wiping in the direction of the grooves with a beat up cotton rag. Grain, which is to the right of the fog, looks like fog, but it doesn't wipe off. Magnifying it gives us a hint why. It may be, it may be a less advanced form of the hairs category you can see to the left. To get a sense of the fineness of these threads, the rules on the bottom of this image are four millimeters apart. And finally, powder degradation looks benign and at this density, its effects are readily removed in, in post. But as you can see, uh, density varies considerably. And notice how the powder is formed on top of content, perhaps the result of increased surface area at the bottom of the grooves. So that's the classification system. And now I'm gonna turn it back to Don to talk about the analysis and understanding of this degradation. Having a small collection of cylinders, I've seen some that are affected by what people call mold and um, didn't think much about it. When John first asked me about it um, and if there might be a way to remove it, this caused me to think more carefully about uh, what we were actually trying to remove, uh, the, the composition of it, that is. Uh, since oxidation is a known problem with fatty acids, my first thought was uh, what we were discussing is more likely a product of the chemical reaction between the fatty acids and air rather than a biological one. Biodiesel and white lithium grease are good examples. Like cylinder wax, both are also made of fatty acids uh, and they'll spend much time in the presence of air. Biodiesel and white lithium grease, however, contain industrial an antioxidants such as uh, tert butyl hydroquinone. Such antioxidants are used in foods at concentrations of up to 0.01%. I've used similar antioxidants in my biodiesel and those are generally um, use a similar dose and are rated to be effective for six months. You'll see similar ingredients on most fryer oil labels. Um, that's butylated hydroxytoluene or BHT as it's usually listed for better label appeal. Uh, mold certainly can be found on fatty acids, but oxidation is so common uh, that there are numerous tests for it. Uh, you can see in the uh, attached analysis that in the ASTM specification for biodiesel, there is an oxidation test. It's uh, circled in red. And the threshold for this test is uh, a mere three hours. In order to find out what we might be looking at, uh, an expert on mold would need to examine the degradation. And finding one uh, took a surprising amount of legwork. 
Uh, so while researching the topic, I reached out to uh, a number of experts on the subject of mold, starting with the uh, mold inspection companies that one easily finds for uh, inspect inspecting uh, flooded residences. Um, I contacted them about uh, hiring them to examine uh, shards from brown wax cylinders and uh, universally all of them declined. So next I started researching university professors and contacted several who had published works on mold, uh, fungus, or other related fields. Uh, many responded that either the problem was outside of their area of expertise or that they would only be able to identify the mold uh, or that if it was mold, if it was still active. Uh, fortunately, one of the, uh, the top rated, uh, that's rated by Google, um, professors is um, uh, Nick Money, uh, who's a professor of botany. And he was generous enough to examine uh, numerous images of three samples. The three samples were chosen based on uh, all of them having advanced forms of degradation. And um, each sample was unique from the other two uh, in its physical manifestation of uh, the degradation. So all three were very degraded and looked quite different from one another. Uh, of these three cylinders, Money found no evidence of mold on two of the samples, and he could not be certain about the third. Uh, the pictures that were sent to him, as well as uh, the full text of his response, is available at the link on the bottom of this slide uh, in case you would like to review it. Following that, uh, two separate oxidation experiments were carried out. The goal of these experiments was to attempt to induce oxidation using known oxidizers. With a sample of oxidized wax, we could then compare the visual characteristics of the deliberately oxidized sample to samples of uh, cylinders which have degraded naturally, such as the ones that you see in the slide. The oxidizers chosen were uh, medical grade oxygen and um, hydrogen peroxide. A brown wax shard was placed in a pressure rated test tube, a vacuum was drawn on it, and then it was pressurized to 60 PSI uh, with compressed oxygen. The pressure was released and the test tube was repressurized with fresh oxygen every other week. After three months, there was no change in appearance of the shard. Um, doing some rough calculations suggests that the, uh, the pressure and uh, the purity of the oxygen would uh, equate to about five years of contact in air, and um, apparently that's not sufficient to have a visible effect. Hydrogen peroxide uh, is a very common laboratory oxidizer, and um, I used 30% uh, Sigma Aldridge uh, brand ACS reagent grade. This is a strong concentration, uh, and it was an easy choice to promote rapid oxidation. So uh, one sample was left in a beaker of the hydrogen peroxide covering the bottom half of the cylinder. And uh, this was performed at room temperature with a residence time of uh, four hours. Another sample was uh, processed in a similar manner, uh, but instead of hydrogen peroxide only, water was used. The hydrogen peroxide treated sample can be seen uh, on this slide, and it has a thick white coat, uh, which is similar to that found on uh, some wax cylinders. The sample uh, that was left in water was also discolored, but only slightly and not in a manner that would generally be described as mold. I feel the similarities between the hydrogen peroxide uh, induced degradation and some of those which occur naturally show that oxidation is one of the main causes of cylinder wax failure. While I had a handmade soap company, I used similar antioxidants and observed uh, they would delay the formation of orange spots for approximately one year. Uh, and this common or this phenomenon is fairly common amongst uh, handmade um, soap makers, uh, and it's referred to as dreaded orange spots, which a uh, great term, and you can Google it. Uh, and these are caused by the oxidation of oleic acid and that's the primary fatty acid found in many plant-based oils. Um, 
Oxidation is a serious issue because it's a negative chemical change uh, of the composition of the wax. In food sciences, it's referred to as the fats being rancid uh, and corresponding oxidation test uh, is known as the Ransomat test. Uh, you can see the candles and a block of lard in this current slide and they've formed uh, a white crust and orange spots which are examples of oxidation which uh, probably wouldn't be thought of as mold except for maybe the uh, black spots at the base of the candles. Uh, these examples are chemically similar to cylinder wax but to better understand conservation steps specific to cylinders we'll need to address some points which John will identify. Thanks, Don. So in addition to understanding these types of degradation, there are additional challenges ahead of us. Um, first, we need to stop or slow further degradation. Um, then there is a need to remove degradation from content. And finally, we need to ascertain the impact of these degradation effects on the carrier um, with recommendations on best practices to address them. Uh, Don's going to address the first uh, points here and I'll take the rest. Oxidation of, um, oxidation of fatty acids is fairly well understood, uh, but it's not clear how much research uh, has been done on studying the oxidation of uh, the insoluble soaps of fatty acids. Uh, and there's virtually uh, no products with comparable properties that we can compare them to. Research will need to start with the laborious task of collecting and concentrating samples of degradation from the surfaces of numerous cylinders. Each sample will need to be cataloged and imaged, uh, and after sufficient analyte has been collected, a laboratory equipped with analytical equipment will need to be contracted to carry out the testing. We would start with tests requiring a minimum of analyte, uh, such as um, elemental analysis. Finding out what elements are in a compound is relatively straightforward. Identifying the molecules is not. Uh, having such small quantities of analyte will make this even more difficult. I suspect that it will eventually require a specialist in some type of chromatography, uh, such as gas chromatography, with an emphasis on organic chemistry. Uh, here you can see a chromatogram uh, that was done during the course of uh, some of my biodiesel research, which shows some corresponding uh, carbon to sulfur peaks. The USDA labs or large labs in uh, fields of uh, food sciences or cosmetics would likely be the ones best suited for this task. Um, but those are all uh, for the future. What about uh, slowing or stopping degradation now? Uh, it's common knowledge that lower temperature is a good observation for long-term storage of organic materials. While this has the uh, undesirable effect of making cylinder wax fragile, uh, unfortunately, it's uh, the current best option. Storage in an inert atmosphere such as nitrogen may be a good option a good option, and it may not be as difficult to implement as it initially sounds. Uh, oxygen concentrators have been on the market for a number of years, and many people rely on them, as opposed to carrying compressed oxygen cylinders. These concentrators work by using a mineral zeolite, uh, which has tiny pores, which separate the gases in air, uh, and then release the oxygen and the nitrogen separately. These concentrators could potentially be used to minimize the oxygen content in long-term storage enclosures with a minimum of maintenance. Regarding uh, the need to remove mold, it's certainly possible that future advance advances may let us read carrier grooves through mold and other surface effects. But Don and I believe that mold should be removed, provided that the removal process does not affect the carrier. <clears throat> um, a case in point is fog. Uh, while Don and I have yet to identify what it is and its long-term effects on cylinders, it's clearly easy to remove and there's no reason not to. But what about removing more intractable forms of degradation? 
While we pursue the areas John, Don just mentioned, we're also pursuing alternate pathways with Charles Kermis of Kermis Audio. Uh, Charles restores vinyl with a system that uses a special surfactant in combination with a multi-frequency ultrasonic bath. He's modified his system with a rotating armature for precise cylinder bathing, and we're currently exploring many treatment parameters and surfactants with him. Here is one of our early test cylinders. Um, note the significant spotting at the top of the cylinder. Uh, note too that the bottom or beginning of the cylinder has no mold. This is not uncommon. Mold often appears only where the box flocking touches it, leaving the, um, uh, the bottom of the record unaffected. To facilitate comparison, uh, Charles and I processed only the top half of this cylinder. And as you can see here after processing, the spotting up top is visible, but much reduced. So how does it sound? Well, uh, here is a spectrogram of it. Um, the left side is the beginning of the record, and you can see that axial section shown above. Uh, you can also see where the mold begins here. And on the right-hand side, um, you can see where the mold was processed. That begins here. Because Zoom handles video poorly, I'm just gonna play sound files and show you where they are on the spectrogram. Uh, here's the first part uh, showing the quality of the mold-free part of the record and, um, and then going into the moldy area. And of course, these are dry transfers, uh, no funny stuff. Getting into the mold. And now here's the second part. It starts here, um, showing the quality of the mold free. I'm sorry, here's the second part, the one we processed. The audio is a bit degraded, but the cylinder is quite playable. And for restorers in the audience, notice that by reducing the mold, we have sharpened these into clicks and crackle that is more readily removed with common digital filters. So clearly Don and I are in the very early innings on this project. We've got a lot of work ahead of us, but we believe we're making progress and getting there. Thanks very much. Fatty acids have been studied for well over a century. And while cylinders have been in preservation starting around 50 or so years ago, there seems to be a disconnect between the bodies of knowledge of lipid sciences and cylinder wax. It's our sincere hope that this presentation will spark some level of interest and encourage others to join us in researching the materials which make up some of our earliest recorded history. Thank you for taking the time to watch our presentation and we now look forward to any questions that you might have. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, this is um, in many ways groundbreaking, I think, in terms of presentations I've seen in the past at ARS conferences. So again, thank you for that. Uh, I'm checking the question box and I don't see any questions right now. If you have, uh, to the audience, if you have questions, please submit them to the, uh, the question box. Uh, and uh, Dan, if I'm missing anything, <laughs> I have both boxes open here, uh, let me know. Uh, I will add one question though myself uh, and forgive me if you mentioned this and I missed it. Um, what is the emphasis of your research on brown wax versus the black wax cylinders that I've seen uh, you show so much? It's, it's uh, actually uh, equal, Tim. Um, 
Uh, brown wax, uh, we just had more examples at hand. Um, but, uh, and, and in fact, it's a, it, tend to, it tends to be a more uh, prevalent uh, carrier to molding, but uh, we are concerned about both. The chemical composition of both of them are uh, similar enough that um, we see it as being parallel. Really? Because I thought that uh, Edison and others were experimenting with different compositions in the 1890s and had pretty much fixed their composition by the time molding came along in 1902, no? Sure. Well, there's definitely differences between brown wax and black wax, but uh, it's an incremental difference. It's not like one is made out of uh, metal and the other one's made out of rubber. Uh, they're both still primarily made out of stearic acid. Okay. And uh, to, to whet everybody's appetite, um, uh, our early results are indicating that there is a difference between molding that appears on two minute cylinders and four minute wax cylinders. And that there may be uh, also a correlation, not only between era, but also manufacture. Okay, that's something you're still experiment or investigating, I guess? Oh, yes, yeah. Okay. Um, one question that has come in from uh, a couple here, from David Seibert. Uh, if you used a reducer and a catalyst, could you possibly make it disappear? <laughs> In my dreams. Don, you want to talk about that? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what you mean by a reducer in the catalyst. Uh, I have no idea, actually. <laughs> um. The... Um... Uh, nothing's being catalyzed in the uh, reaction. What we're looking for is uh, uh, solubility, uh, mostly based on pH. Uh, when it comes to solvents, we found that if a solvent will affect uh, the crud, that it will also affect the, uh, the healthy wax below it. Um, so it's mostly been a modification of pH. And uh, so far, most of the success has been um, going towards the acidic, uh, the um, uh, going towards um, raising the uh, pH tends to um, uh, saponify or uh, turn into soap the, um, the healthy wax. Uh, have you had the chance to discuss chemical composition of cylinders with Eric Monroe at the Library of Congress? Might he be helpful in your research? Um, I've seen the presentation that he previously made, and I read the paper that he published. Um, uh, it all seemed relatively straightforward. Uh, I haven't had the opportunity to uh, contact him. Um, I've not reached out to him uh, as of yet, uh, but I do certainly intend to. Okay. Uh, from Seth Winter, uh, John, was there any mold residue on the stylus after it passed over the cleaned area? Did some of the mold come off after playback? No. I, no, that's, that, that is, uh, uh, now in um, some cases, these cylinders were given a wash with a very dilute solution of lab tone for those who've been involved in this for a while, they know that lab tone has uh, been used for a while. It's a, it's a common old fungicide uh, and it's good at removing dirt. Um, so these were clean cylinders from that standpoint, and uh, in terms of stylus residue, there was none. Okay, and um, I guess this is a contact suggestion. Does ARSC Cylinder Subcommittee have any intelligence to offer on this matter? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I think, I think, uh, uh, to my knowledge, this is kind of uncharted waters, uh, but I certainly am, uh, am open to uh, learning more than others have experimented with. Okay, I know, I know that we're doing some research, I'm not sure where it stands, we're doing some research on uh, compositions uh, and how they changed over time, but perhaps you have that uh, information already. Um, all right, I think that's it, uh, and we've reached six o'clock. So again, thank you very much, uh, John and Donald both. Uh, this you, presentation will be uh, posted, of course, and uh, reviewable. Uh, any last words? Thanks very much, Tim. It okay. A, it was a great session.
Very good session. Thank you very much. Thank you.